Welcome to Discovering the Law. My name is Lucy Rivera and I am your host for today. Today we have a very special guest. We have Middlesex County District Attorney Marianne Ryan with us. And please remember this episode can be viewed at www.discoveringthelaw.com. DA Ryan, thank you for being here with us oh, today. Thank you for having me. Uh, please tell us about the um, overdose problem and opiate abuse in Middlesex County, please. Well, is everybody's been talking about it's mm -hmm. really become a problem not just in Middlesex or in Massachusetts but really across the country um, the numbers in the last three years have really risen dramatically uh, and what information do you have about the overdose um, in Middlesex County as far as the numbers uh, this year so far so so far this year we're almost at May 1st we're almost five months into the mm -hmm. year and mm -hmm. we've unfortunately already had about 69 overdose deaths mm -hmm. and that is up from two, in 2012, our number was just over 60 for the whole year. Oh. So here we are one quarter of the way into the year, a uh, third of the way into the year, and we're at the same number. Why is that change? I think there's probably three reasons. Um, number one is because heroin, and we're talking particularly about opiates, heroin is so cheap right now. Mm -hmm. um, you can buy a bag of heroin for 4 to $6 on the street, oh. so less than cigarettes. Um, a second is that we also have um, a number of individuals who are, this, what's out there is so powerful that even people who are very experienced users are using the same amount, finding out it's many, many times more powerful than uh -huh. they're used to and causing the overdose piece. So that's a problem. And the third is, I think, much of the abuse of opiates begins with some prescription uh -huh. opiates, and there's just a lot more opiates out there, prescription opiates. That increase is alarming. Mm -hmm. So what are the steps that you are taking? And I think you, you mentioned that you've been taking the steps since 2012. I have. It was in 2012 that we, I first really saw the spike mm -hmm. in the numbers that we were having. So we, I began, co-founded an opiate task force to start bringing everybody to the table who needed to be involved in this and really taking a multi-pronged approach because this is going to be a long-term problem. I mean, we, the numbers of people affected are so high. It's going to take us a long term, a long time to start reversing that trend and mm -hmm. get people into treatment, start getting the amount of opiates off the street that are out there. And that's really what our aim is, to do sort of four things. What is this opiate task force that you just mentioned all about? Sure. The task force is centered, as are many of our programs as we address things, in a hospital. Mm -hmm. Because we know lots of people who don't necessarily want to deal with the police or with the DA's office will go to the hospital. Yes. And because this is a public safety issue, but it's also a public health issue. Mm -hmm. You know, we're losing lots and lots of young people to opiate overdoses. So at the hospital, we bring together the treatment providers, the police, mm -hmm. um, everybody who interacts with people who might suffer from an opiate addiction. Is that the uh, initiative that you call SCOPE? Nope, SCOPE of Pain is okay. a piece, as a program that we ran as part of the, the task force. That's a training that we partnered with BU School of Medicine. Okay. And that training is focused on people who have the ability to write a prescription for opiates. So doctors, nurse practitioners, dentists, all of those. Mm -hmm. And it teaches them to th what kinds of questions they want to be asking before they write an opiate prescription. Talk about are there alternatives to using opiates. Um, well, I wanted to ask you also yeah. about the um, the opiate problem and the, the what do you is there a, a way that you're addressing the over prescription of this kind of medications from medical yep people professionals it, one thing is by bringing this program to really try to educate people to the program itself I've also um, worked with some of our legislative partners to file some legislation mm -hmm. which mm -hmm. would limit the amount of opiates that you're able to get either in an emergency room or in a walk-in clinic to a 72-hour supply. So obviously, if you have an accident or you have something happening, you need some opiates, you'll still be able to go to one of those places, like a clinic or an ER, and get them. But you're not going to get a 90-day supply. You're going to get enough to get you through the weekend, get you through the next couple of days, get you back to your primary care doctor, mm -hmm. and limit how much you have. And uh, as far as maybe addressing the overly prescribing, not only um, not just the, the time limitation, but the fact that they just prescribe harder uh, pain medication than normally should 
be necessary for? I think that in part that's something we're trying to work with the prescribers on through like scope of pain. But mm -hmm. it's also a community issue because I would say the best <clears throat> example of this is when I was in high school and college, I didn't know a lot of people who had had the kind of surgery for which they would have been prescribed opiates. I have a couple of college age kids now. They have lots of friends who've either had their wisdom teeth out, mm -hmm. had a torn knee or a shoulder, and they've had access to opiates. So mm -hmm. they're much younger, they've had those prescriptions, and they've had prescriptions for a good amount of opiates. As a society, we have to think about how much of that medication we want out there. Right, and is that, that's one of the bills that you are uh, that you filed. Right, to limit the amount of that. Also, to, we've been working with, for instance, real estate agents, mm -hmm. because what we started to see was people go to an open house on Sunday, mm -hmm. and they're going through medicine cabinets and taking out oh. unused prescriptions. You don't ever notice it because you didn't know you had it. Mm -hmm. We've been providing to our police departments drug collection boxes so that 24-7, if you have a prescription, you know, something happens, you get a prescription, you take two of the pills you don't need anymore, you can just go down and safely get rid of them. Um, now, tell us about the other initiative that you are working, that you... Um Sure. Uh, work, the uh, first responders initiative? Yep. We did a training. We have 54 cities and towns in okay. Middlesex. We brought together all of our first responders, police and fire, trained them on the use of nasal naloxone, the, the opiate reversal drug, when they arrive, if they're the first one on the scene when somebody suffered an overdose. It's also known as... Mm, um, Narcan? Narcan. Yep, yes. yep, that's the same. Mm -hmm. And we also provided every city and town with 10 doses. Mm -hmm. to get the, in the hopes that that would be seed drug, that you know the cities and towns would see how valuable that was and that they would start to provide that for the first responders. And how, what did you find on this? Is it working? What we found is it works incredibly well. I mean, unfortunately, as high as the number of opiate deaths have gone, mm -hmm. we're hearing from our partners, for instance, the ambulance companies and our first responders, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. that they are having, they're using that Narcan, they're going through the doses that they're being given. And fortunately, in a majority of cases, it revives people. You know, it's not mm -hmm. a cure for an addiction, mm -hmm. but it gives you that opportunity to have another day to mm -hmm. seek some help or some treatment. Okay. Um, I wanted to also ask you uh, of your other initiative of um Another other initiatives at Middlesex that you've sure. uh, working on? We've been, as I said, taking this multi-pronged approach. So we've been doing the prevention piece. We've been out um, in the schools mm -hmm. talking to kids. We've been in the community talking to parents and educators about what to look for. We've begun an <coughs> initiative with some of our hospitals that deliver mm -hmm. babies across the county because we have a number of hospitals that have been delivering opiate-exposed newborns. So what we know is that when somebody's pregnant, that is often a moment when they really will make that big step to get some help for their addiction, to, to protect their child. So we've been partnering mm -hmm. with the hospitals to be helping to develop really a whole source of care so that an, OB, um, an OBGYN is asking a woman, you know, is, are there any issues? Do you need some help? Mm -hmm. All of those things as they're coming to them for their pregnancy. So is that part of, um, you're partnering with hospitals? Yes. Uh, in order to, and so is it fair to say that your, your um, I guess your platform as a Middlesex DA is to combat overdose? Yes, and, yes. And, and to do that in a partnership model because, mm -hmm. you know, what's clear is the police and DAs can't do it themselves. We need the doctors to be helping us. We need the community to help. We need teachers. We need parents. We need every, mm -hmm. this is a big problem. And everybody needs to really be looking at it and thinking about ways that they can be helpful. Um, you know, we're looking at the treatment piece. Part of the task force was successful in getting some treatment beds opened up at the old Tewksbury mm -hmm. State Hospital. Those beds are full almost all of the time. Um, we brought a new drug court into Middlesex County. We now run six drug courts across the county. You know, where people can be held responsible with, for what they've done, but if they choose to be able to get the kind of treatment that they need to reverse the direction of this addiction. Mm -hmm. um, we're interested in learning about the uh, success that you've seen. Mm -hmm. You've seen the increase since 2012 to now. Right. What, um, I know five months, six months in, in the year. Yeah, it's a, I mean, we are seeing that we're making a difference. We're certainly mm -hmm. putting, for instance, that Narcan out there. We're seeing mm -hmm. that that's working. We have those treatment beds. Those treatment beds are full. 
we're doing the drug court. We see people coming in and it's a long, you know, drug court is a long road for people. It's very difficult. But we're seeing people make it to the other end of that program. The odds, if they can make it through that program, that they can beat the addiction are very, very high. Um, so we are seeing progress, but it has to be seen in the context of it. it is going to, we didn't get here so quickly. It's going to take a long term to try to reverse the direction here. Can you speak to the uh, overdo uh, overdose problem and opiate abuse um, in other counties in compared to your to Middlesex County, which is the county you lead? Well, Middlesex is the largest county mm -hmm. um, with about 1.6 million people. We are okay. bigger than 11 states in the United States. So that's the size of our population. Mm -hmm. So the other counties are much smaller in terms of population, but every single county mm -hmm. has been seeing what we're seeing, an increase in overdoses where mm -hmm. folks survive, fortunately, an overdose in opiate-related deaths, um, and just a general greater use of opiates by people in their county. Now, you did mention that uh, the overdose is mostly because of obliterated drugs or drugs that are stronger, but in, in the terms of prescription medications mm -hmm. such as Percocet, why is that? Well, I think it's a societal piece. I mean, you know, as a society, we don't like to be in pain. So if something happens, people, you know, understandably, and, and leaving aside the people who have a legitimate pain issue, that they have chronic pain, and obviously need to have access to some of those drugs. But, you know, one of the reasons why it's prescribed so often is because people right. go in for a procedure, they want to feel better, they want to go back to work, mm. they want to do whatever, and they want something to help them get there. Well, managing pain is important, but mm -hmm. however, um, I, it, it just it seems like doctors just reach out to prescribing stronger drug medications when... Right. Mm -hmm. I mean, I think we were talking earlier. Yeah. You told me about an example you had yourself, which is typical. <laughs> you go in for something like a dental right. procedure or something, and you get some very serious opiate prescriptions mm -hmm. rather than maybe, you know, some ice or Tylenol or whatever right. that might have been just as effective. Uh, would there be, uh, is there any um, legislation that potentially could be helpful just to manage how doctors, how often, or, or is there a way to measure why isn't that that doctor prescribed a Tylenol, for instance, as opposed to Percocet or, or some other codeine or Vicodin? Or? Well, and one of the things is, you know, it's both doctors, you know, we know for the most part are doing the best they can for their patients. And it is because doctors know their patients the best that we are trying to limit the amount that people are getting from somebody they don't know as well, the emergency room doctor or the script, um, the clinic who's writing that script for them. But also we're looking at the idea of educating doctors to even be rethinking yes. do i is this the drug that i need to be prescribing um you know we're concerned about that prescription piece because the, massachusetts has put in place a physician's monitoring program Excellent. so that the idea is that before a doctor would write a script for an opiate he would go in and say lucy rivera have you had a similar prescription anytime recently what else are you taking and is my giving you this script a good idea? Um, that pro that's been a little difficult to get in place. It's a little mm. cumbersome. It takes some time for the doctor. Um, it, there is a, about a 10-day lag so that if I got a prescription today and I went for a prescription tomorrow, I wouldn't be seeing that. And it is only in-state prescriptions, which for us is a problem because in Middlesex, we have a large number of colleges and universities. Mm -hmm. You know, it's not unusual that, for instance, a student has an injury at school. They go to the school infirmary. They get a prescription for some kind of opiates. This weekend, yes. they go home to Connecticut. They can get another, you know, and go to a doctor that they know there, or their family physician or their pediatrician, whatever, and get another script. So that, you know, these, we're working on this and moving this forward, encouraging people to use the physician monitoring program. Obviously, the, um, the Commonwealth's been great in working on that and trying to reduce that lag time. You know, maybe we'll eventually be able to be track prescriptions from other states. But all of that's important in more responsibly putting those drugs out there. And is this, um, are you working on this now? Is this, this is exciting because it's real accountability yes. to the doctors, which is necessary. Right, right. And um, well, we, we are proud of that. Thank you. And we commend you for that effort. Tell us about, 
or interested to know about other bills that you are interested in that you'd like to push and or are filing? Sure. With respect to the um, the drug issue, we also filed a bill to make um, a new synthetic drug, which is known as N Bomb or Smiles. Mm, okay. It's a very cheap, uh, <clears throat> about a dollar a tab. It's a synthetic LSD. It comes primarily as um, little tabs, like a book of stamps, oh. or it can come in the very small bottle, an eyedrop kind of thing, so it's easy to hide. Mm. The tabs are marketed with sort of cartoon-type characters, oh. so they're aimed at you know teenagers, young kids. kids. Um, obviously, if somebody's got that kind of drug, and it's you know like a book of stamps, it's easy to shove in a book bag oh. or in a pocket. You're not going to see that. Um, the, it's a very dangerous drug. They've already mm -hmm. been reports of 19 people across the country dying either from the drug or the behavior. So we try to make that illegal. That's not presently illegal in Massachusetts. Uh, are you, what are your, um, what, what do you feel in terms of that kind of legislation? I think uh, it's important. I think it's important, first of all, to get parents and teachers aware that the drug is out there. Okay. Also, if police come upon it or see somebody selling it, or you, they want to be able to, to seize that and get that off the street. Why? I'm sorry, yeah, why isn't sure. that illegal? Because it's a new drug. Okay. It's, it's literally a manufactured drug. You know, it's a synthetic copy of LSD. Oh, and, you know, our drug statutes have to constantly be being changed as new things come up. Um, you know, we live in Massachusetts. We have a lot of very smart people here, a lot of people very connected outside to buy. Like, for instance, this drug was developed by somebody who put the chemicals together to create this synthetic drug. It's primarily sold on the internet, mm -hmm. so people are getting it. It's cheap, bringing it here, but it just wasn't on the list of illegal drugs here. What and cl what category would that drug? We we'll go into form? Class B. It'd be a Class B drug. So cocaine kind of right. a drug. That level. LSD. Yeah. It's mm -hmm. very serious. It's very serious. It's very serious. Uh, today we have District Attorney uh, from Middlesex County. Mary Ann Ryan with us. She is talking to us of, about a very important topic, which is drug overdose. And um, DA Ryan, uh, please tell us about other initiatives that you have in mind or that you see out there in the community. Well, with respect to this, we're doing that. We've also, in, in sort of a related effort, you know, some of the violence that we see with the sale of drugs. I mean, one of the things we're looking at in terms of our enforcement piece is really targeting, you know, for so many people, selling drugs has just really become big business. Mm -hmm. There's a lot of drugs out there. There's a lot of money to be made. You know, one of the things we've seen is we know, for instance, some drug dealers, it's such a business, have what they're known as free Sundays. So on Sundays, they're giving the drugs away, mm -hmm. knowing that it's so addictive that once you start using, you'll be a customer for life. So that's what we're looking at, really our enforcement effort, our prosecution effort, trying to target those people who are moving a lot of product on the street, who are making a lot of money from the misery of other people by selling that. So we're really looking to be doing that kind of piece as well. Who are your partners to address this issues that are affecting the Commonwealth and this So we okay. have in the enforcement piece, we obviously have a strong partnership with our police department, with the state police, um, with the federal authorities in some cases. For instance, before NBOM, until the NBOM legislation passes, any prosecution for finding that drug would have to be done federally because it's not illegal in Massachusetts. No. So all of those are working together in a partnership. Um, things like the Postal Service, because very often, because it is a business, just like you or I in our work, might have packages delivered by the post office. We are increasingly seeing people who are moving a lot of drugs using the post office or UPS or one of those kind of services to mail their drugs. In the instance of this uh, new drug that is targeted, targeting teenagers right. that you can keep, I'm not, I don't remember the name. n -bomb. N -bomb. Yeah. How is that getting criminalized? We, we, we have, with our legislative partners, filed a okay. bill that would add that drug. There are three synthetic variations, and they would add it to the schedule of illegal drugs in Massachusetts. And, and so far, if someone gets, can someone get arrested for that behavior? They can't get, they can't get charged with that drug right now because okay. that's not illegal. Mm. You know, they would have to be dangerous. prosecuted under the federal authorities because about a year and a half ago, the federal government added it to their list of illegal drugs. And um, 
uh, do you have any comments as to um, as we br uh, we we, we um, have a few minutes left? But sure. what are do you have any comments that you want to share with the public and that or message that you want? To I think the yeah. message is twofold. Really, it is that this has been a problem that's been developing for some period of time. Mm -hmm. So turning it around, getting people back on track, getting them treatment, prosecuting those people who are moving the product, really educating people. Um, beginning with our young people as well as their parents and teachers to help them avoid the trap of addiction. That's going to take us a long time. Mm -hmm. And no one, no community piece can do that alone. It really has to be a partnership effort. And in Middlesex, I think we've done a good job of really bringing to the table everybody who has a stake in this. And then by dividing our work up into those four categories of education, prevention, treatment, and prosecution, it helps us to really focus and look at what do we need in this area and develop a partnership or a program to address that. Um, what do you feel about um, not criminalizing certain uh, drug uh, drugs, for instance? Or, um, well, you know, I think many things, it's also a question of timing. Right now, the problem we have is that there's a lot of drugs out there, and they mm -hmm. are having a very adverse effect on people. So, you know, I think right now, my primary focus is on dealing with this spike in addiction that we've seen, and in dealing with just the real horror and misery that it's causing for so many families. Why are there so many more now, many drugs out there? Um, I think it's partly it's supply. There's a lot out there. Consumption. Um, there's the cutting of drugs that makes them much more powerful. And obviously, oh. if you have one pound of something and you cut it with things, you can spread that out into a lot more. And also, <laughs> I think that, you know, it's there's just also this use of the much stronger kinds of drugs mm -hmm. that are much more harmful than people are anticipating. So even somebody who's been a user for a long time who might think, I can use this much cocaine or heroin, suddenly what they bought on the street, you know, the gov there's no government agency inspecting for purity what somebody's selling on the street. So you don't really know what you're buying, and oftentimes you're buying a drug mixed with something else that's very, very dangerous. And the price of drugs, for the most part, has gone down. Are your counterpart district attorneys working as hard as you are. I think we're all working hard on this problem. It is, you know, it's a loss of lives. It's a loss of a lot of lives. And with effort and with collaboration, it is preventable. Um, dear Ryan, tell us about uh, the operation you run at Middlesex County District Attorney's Office. Um, we have a wonderful office. Um, we are a large office because we have such a large county. We have a staff of about 258 people um, scattered across our very big geographic county. Um, we have 11 district courts, two superior court locations. So our staff breaks down primarily into three. It's our assistant district attorneys, our victim witness advocates who are just invaluable in helping people through that system, and then obviously our support and administrative staff. So we have people who work very, very hard for the public good um, across the county. And where are your superior courts? We have okay. one in Woburn and one in Lowell. Wonderful. Yeah. Dear Ryan, your, any final thoughts? We're wrapping up. Um, we no, thank you for having me. <laughs> this is ob we're ob I'm obviously happy to have an opportunity to talk to people. Just get people thinking and talking about these issues. How can we reach your office? Um, you can go on our website, Middlesex DA's office, and we have lots of information there and lots of phone and contact thank information. You. Thank you. Dear Thanks Ryan. for having Appreciate me. Appreciate it. Uh, thank you, all of you, for your time. Today, we got to learn about Middlesex County. We got to learn about the issues that are affecting all of us in Massachusetts as far as drug overdose. Please view this um, episode at www.discoveringthelaw.com. DA Marion Ryan is here with us today, and my name is Lucy Rivera. Thank you for watching. Mm -hmm.